significance and the reason why we need to preserve the site. So Bob uh, has the artifacts, or, or the, the Kansas uh, State Historical Society. State Historical Society has the artifacts. Bob doesn't necessarily have them. Although he did bring some. If you haven't seen them, they're over here in the corner. Uh, Bob helped us out with the archaeological significance of the uh, Quindaro site. I think the primary artifact of Quindaro is Quindaro itself in its setting and in its landscape. And let's, let's start with that. The runes that are extant, that you can go see now, paint a, a very vivid picture uh, of what went on at the town. The, the fact that the town was there so briefly, built up so quickly, and then pretty much abandoned and, as Larry pointed out, scavenged. Um, but we do, in fact, have over 100,000 artifacts that, that Larry had excavated. And uh, we ask that those come to the Kansas Historical Society because we are a public repository. And I'm going to briefly go through these images, and if you'll just change images in order for me, um, just to, to, so you have an idea of what's going on with the artifacts. Next image, please. But I want to point out that we have uh, 168 square feet, cubic feet, excuse me, of artifacts. This is, whoops, sorry. <clears throat> This is half of them. All of these boxes that you see, this is just half of the artifacts that we have there. Um, by the way, if we were to charge for this, it would be about $58,000. It's what it costs to, it's what we charge for curation in our facility. And the reason it's so expensive to store these artifacts, they're under, they're behind three different series of locked doors, 24 hour security, fire alarm, fire suppression system, video surveillance, full-time laboratory supervisor, and I want to point this out. Access for researchers, while we do, while they are, quote, hidden in the basement of the Kansas Historical Society, we have a lot of people that do come to see these artifacts. We also take images of some of the artifacts, not all, there's over 100,000, and we put them online with some information so people know that the artifacts are there, so they can see them for themselves, sometimes in multiple views, bottom top, multiple sides. We have a, a desk in the museum. So, you don't necessarily even have to come to Topeka to see the artifacts. Uh, there is the possibility of getting an idea of what's there online. Um, as Paul will attest, we have thousands of records that are also um, well stored, well cared for, uh, easy to find, which includes maps of the area. These are our file folders. This is just a sample of some of them as well as uh, primary documents in our, in our record center as well. And as a result of the artifacts coming from Quindaro to Topeka, Kansas, we've had a number of people borrow those and use them for exhibits, use them for student training, use them for uh, academic and non-academic reports that have been written. So you've got an image here of some students from Washburn University who created an exhibit of Quindaro artifacts. And I'm not going to go through this list, but it's a laundry list of, of some of the um, exhibits that have resulted from borrowed collections from our institution to get the word out about Quindera, its existence here in Kansas City, Kansas. Uh, don't expect you to read all that, but there's a partial <laughs> listing of the reports that have been written um, on Quindero not necessarily as a result of them being at the Kansas Historical Society, but the ones that are highlighted definitely are a direct result of the artifacts being in our repository, um, including our own publication where we've done uh, several feature articles on the Quindero ruins and the artifacts as well. And we have a lot of visitors, some of these might look familiar to you. Um, uh, Jefferson Edward Donald came with a Kansas Humanities Council grant and produced, he's produced a number of videos, but one of them is about Quindaro, and there's the URL if you want to copy it down based on our collections. We've had representatives of uh, KCPT and the Delaware Nation and the Unitarian Universal Fellowship, um, Unified Government, Washington University, and uh, Kansas City Community College come and visit and use the artifacts for a variety of purposes. I'm just trying to make a case that, that uh, when I petitioned the Unified Government of Kansas City in 
2007 or 2009, I can't remember, maybe Larry Hanks, you can. But we, we asked for the artifacts to come to our repository so they, they would be widely available, so they would get some publicity, so they would be stored uh, in perpetuity in an in a orderly fashion. And this is not to say that they wouldn't necessarily have been that way before, but we can ensure that longevity. Uh, the Historical Society has been around for a long time, and, and I, I wanted to guarantee for that. I also made a point of making sure that this uh, transition was done in public and at a public meeting of the commission, and so people had a chance to speak out either for or against it. Um, it was not a, it was a very open process. Um, so the question, though, is what's the importance of the artifacts? And as, as an archaeologist can can go into minute detail about the kinds of things that people were eating, where they were getting their food. You can ask questions about this territorial town. Were they, were they getting a lot of wild food in the area? This is a territory. Were they all getting their food shipped in from the east? Where are their commodities coming from? What kinds of building materials um, were available to them and what were chosen to be used? But I, again, I want to reiterate, we have all of those artifacts. There is the opportunity for these fine green studies to take place. But the big artifact really is the site really is the site and, and where it is. Does that address your question? Well, well as, a, as a journalist, I'm always asking that same question. <laughs> what makes this site different from any other site? It's, it's, there are a lot of territorial towns that developed in Kansas. Um, and a lot of them are short-lived. Uh, there's an institute at Kansas State University that documents all of these so-called ghost towns that maybe only live five or six years, and a lot of them we find virtually no trace of those towns. Quindaro is different, is that there's much more than a trace there. But not only that is a rather unique history. You have um, the Delaware Nation, you have uh, the New England immigrant aid folks um, developing this. You also have land speculation going on. All of this is happening in one place, and in, in, in contrast with um, some of the non-abolitionist towns that also were popping up at the same time. You had a very rapid and significant development. You had a newspaper, you had a hotel. Um, but all of these things, and, and then abolitionism, and, and that being part of the, not necessarily the written charter, but the intention of the town of Quinderos to aid the abolitionist cause, to have all of that going on in this one place, and then have some ruins preserved that people can look at and gain a fuller understanding, I think is extremely significant. And um, I'm scratching my brain to think of other archaeological sites in the region that have all of those things going on. In combination. In combination. And still have some remains there. Well, I